Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My guest today is Michael Kugelman. Michael is Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia for the Wilson Center's Asia Program. He joins us today to discuss two topics. We're going to talk about the changing government in Pakistan and also U.S.-Indian relations in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Michael, welcome. Thank you for joining us. So let's start with Pakistan. Uh, Imran Khan's uh, term as prime minister comes to a screeching halt after a, a no confidence vote. Uh, this was a long time coming, correct? This didn't just happen overnight. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, there was a process that began uh, some months ago uh, by the political opposition to bring a vote of confidence um, to the parliamentary floor. And uh, essentially what happened, you know, in Pakistan, um, the electoral calendar is not is typically not respected. So if the political opposition thinks it has an opportunity um, to try to drive out the uh, the government of the day, it'll capitalize on that opportunity. And that opportunity really came in November when uh, Prime Minister Khan uh, had a dispute with the Pakistani army chief, who was a, very, a really powerful political player. And Khan essentially lost the support of the army chief. And uh, at that point, the opposition knew it had an, opp an opportunity to pounce, and it did by making the uh, the arrangements to bring forward this vote of confidence uh, motion. Officially, the justification was economic misgovernance. And it is true that in recent months, Pakistan's economy has taken a major tumble. Explain to us what the relationship is between the government and the military, right? In, in this country, if the president had a difference of opinion with the Secretary of Defense, it's more likely that the Secretary of Defense would be out and not the president. That's not what happened in Pakistan. Right. I mean, the, the notion of uh, civilian supremacy uh, over the military is, is really not a thing uh, in Pakistan. We, we don't see the, the, current, the common military coups that we had seen in past years. And in fact, it's been well more than a decade. In fact, it's, uh, it's been uh, since 2008 when you last had a military government. But uh, in Pakistan, uh, with these civilian-led governments, the military is always looming, so to speak. It tends to be one of these behind-the-scenes um, movers and shakers that exert significant levels of political influence. And basically, if you're a civilian prime minister and you defy the military, especially if you do it repeatedly, you could find yourself out of a job or you could find yourself increasingly vulnerable. Imran Khan, many people thought when he first became prime minister that he, he may not last long because his personality is, is very strong and stubborn. He's not one to defy to authority, um, but he did. Uh, he did defer to the military because he really wanted the job of prime minister. It's only in recent months when I guess his instincts got the best of him. He did turn against the army chief on, a, on one or two major issues, and that really signaled the, the, uh, the, the beginning of the end for Imran Khan. So he's not going quietly. Uh, the, in the lead up, he attempted to dissolve parliament to slow things down. Eventually, the courts interceded. Uh, he's made accusations of foreign interference, the US and others wanting him out. Uh, it, and now he will lead the opposition. Is he still going to be a significant player in Pakistani politics? Yeah, absolutely. It would not be Imran Khan's style or brand of politics to simply uh, disappear quietly into the night. He's going to stick around. And in fact, it's notable that the, the very day after he was ousted from government, uh, he called on uh, his supporters to take to the streets and protest. And you had thousands of people uh, in all the major cities, most of the major cities in Pakistan take to the streets. So that's an indication that he is someone that does enjoy significant levels of public support. Uh, people make a big deal out of the fact that, that he may well have been elected prime minister in 2008 because he received some backhanded support from the military, but he, does, he can count on public support, especially from uh, a key constituency, young, urban, middle-class, conservative Pakistanis. We saw them out in the streets and he will, he will do in the opposition uh, what he did in, as an opposition leader for many years until 2018, and that is to try to be disruptive, to try to cause trouble for the government. And uh, he really believes, or he claims that he, he believes that this, this new government was indeed um, brought in thanks to a, uh, an effort on, uh, colluding with the United States to, to oust him. So he's gonna maintain this narrative that he was victimized by this US-led conspiracy that brought to power these traitors uh, who have no business taking over. Strong rhetoric. Any validity to his charges? I don't think so. His allegations are based on a, uh, a cable uh, that was sent to Islamabad by the outgoing Pakistani ambassador to the US, which captured a private conversation between that ambassador and a senior US official. 
in which the senior U.S. official vented. I mean, he complained, he said that the relationship would be in a better place if Imran Khan were to lose the no confidence vote. Now, of course, that doesn't indicate that the U.S. was actually behind the no confidence vote, but um, you know, Khan essentially made that leap. And I, and I should say that it's it's a narrative, uh, it's an allegation that has gotten and will continue to get traction uh, in Pakistan, just because the, a lot of people in Pakistan have a fair amount of dist distrust of U.S. policies and tend to assume the worst about U.S. intentions. And you know, there is a track record, to be very candid, of U.S. interference and U.S. meddling in the domestic politics of Pakistan in the past. So given that context, it's not a surprise that he would make that, that allegation and that he would assume rightly that it would help bring him some support and, and sympathy at a moment when he was uh, quite vulnerable politically. So tell us about the new uh, prime minister, Shabazz, if, what, what about him? So this is someone who has, has never been prime minister before, but he had served um, multiple times in the role of chief minister in the province of Punjab. Chief minister is similar to a U.S. government position. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the chief minister of Punjab, which is Pakistan's most populous state, its most affluent state. It's a pretty significant, pardon me, province. It's a very significant province politically for those reasons. And he, he had a reputation, he had a pretty good reputation for the most part as someone who was pretty under, understated, very focused on getting things done, uh, focused on, on, on reform, focused on infrastructure projects. Uh, but at the same time, he, he, he does face uh, significant corruption charges, which he and his supporters have always said are politically driven. But he and his brother and other members of his party have faced these, uh, these allegations. But he's very different from Imran Khan. He's not very charismatic. Uh, he's not a populist, uh, you know. He's a pretty understated guy, um, and he is controversial because of the co because of the corruption charges. But he doesn't have that that huge, larger than life presence than than Imran Khan does. Can we expect any significant changes in policy or in relations, foreign relations for Pakistan with this change of government? I mean, keeping in mind that the time frame for this government is not going to be long enough, I think, in order to, to assume that we could see changes. The next elections in Pakistan are due to happen in just over a year. And, it, and who knows, the elections could happen earlier. So yes, I think that he will try to make some changes. Uh, and one of the big ones refer, relates to foreign policy. Um, he will try, unlike Imran Khan, he will try to engage more heavily with the West, including the United States, in fact, soon after Shabazz Sharif uh, became prime minister in his first speech, he said that he values relations with the US and with the West. Uh, there will be some similarities. He is going to continue, he's going to um, continue where Imran Khan left off and where most Pakistani leaders have gone, and that is to pursue strong relations with China, which is Pakistan's closest ally and a key economic and military backer. Um, I think that he will also uh, take some significant changes when it comes to economic policy. Pakistan has got a major economic crisis, debt crisis, soaring inflation. Imran Khan had tried to, he, he put out a, a major stimulus package not long before he was, he was, he was ousted. That contributed to the rising inflation rates. Uh, but Sharif is going to focus on austerity to the extent that he can. He's going to go back to the IMF to try to get uh, a, a new step in the a new tranche of the uh, the current bailout package. He would like to get that implemented. But it's a tough balance for Shabazz Sharif to pull off because he recognizes that he needs to do austerity to get the economic the economy uh, back to equilibrium. But you know this is a, a very short term for this government. He doesn't want to do anything that could that could anger the masses who are already upset because of the economic crisis. So pretty pretty difficult uh, balancing act for them to pull off. Whenever there's a change of power in any in every government, there you know at least whispers or minor questions about stability of the entire operation, particularly when you're talking about a nuclear state. And any concerns in that regard? Are we talking about a stable situation? We saw that the courts were heavily involved, so the checks and balances are in place. Yeah, I mean, the fact that uh, despite a number of threats uh, from Imran Khan, he did accept the vote of, of the, the assembly that ousted him. He stepped down. Um, so in this sense, there, there has been a peaceful transfer of power. And we've seen several consecutive peaceful transfers of power uh, in Pakistan, with no military takeover or anything like that. And Just been, ahead of schedule. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not since 2008 has been there been a military government. But it is going to be a very tense political environment, I think, just because Imran Khan is going to really try to put a lot of pressure on this government. He's going to keep up this, this rhetoric about... Uh, 
you know, traders that work with the U.S. to oust them, that's really strong rhetoric. And that could make a what, what had already been a very charged political environment uh, even stronger. And if you throw in the economic crisis and the soaring food prices, which have a lot of people among the public unhappy, you know, that, that, that suggests that um, if things continue to go down this road, there is the risk of, 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 of protest that could well turn violent, especially as we get into the summer months and the heat comes on. So that's, that's the concern. But in terms of broader security concerns, uh, I, I don't think there's an issue there. There has been a resurgence in terrorist attacks in Pakistan over the last year, but not at the levels, nothing near the levels Pakistan had experienced some years ago. And as for the nuclear weapons, I really don't think that the, the U.S. and other key capitals are as concerned about issues of nuclear safety as they used to be. So it really comes down to the issue of internal stability drawing from the charged political environment. So let's uh, shift gears now, Michael, to I India. And uh, a couple of days ago, at the time of our taping of this discussion, uh, President Biden and uh, Mr. Modi had a, a phone conversation, talked about they'll meet, I guess they'll meet in person uh, later in the year. Uh, how did it go? And uh, how happy or unhappy is the U.S. with India in regards to its posture toward Russia? Yeah, so certainly the Russia factor uh, has has caused some some concerns for the relationship. And you know, the, India's position on the uh, Ukraine crisis and refusing to condemn Russia, this is nothing new. I mean, India is a close friend of Russia. It's never condemned Russian aggressions. But I think for the US, that position is particularly concerning now, given that this is an especially egregious aggression, right? And it's the entire invasion of Ukraine, the US-India relationship has also never been stronger, which means the expectations of the US of India are higher. And also, I mean, the Biden administration has specifically called on the world's uh, democracies to band together to push back against Russia. And of course, <coughs> India is, a, is, one, is, is the world's largest democracy, for sure. But you know, I think if you look at what happened with these, these meetings in recent days, this two plus two dialogue, where you had the Indian foreign and defense ministers here meeting with their US counterparts, the scope of the cooperation, uh, the scope of the conversation was very broad, which I think gives a sense of how multifaceted and broad based this relationship is. I mean, it revolves around security cooperation, arms trade, cons joint concern about China, but they also talked about issues like technology and even clean energy, pandemic assistance, Biden and Modi talked about these things too. So that I think reinforces the fact that there's enough insulation in this relationship um, to be able to withstand the inevitable shocks that come about every now and then, such as the issue with Russia. But in terms of how upset or unhappy the US is, um, I think that it certainly would prefer that India change its position. It recognizes that it's not going to do so. It has continued to call on India to do so. But I think what we're going to see from the US is efforts over the mid to long term to convince India that Russia is no longer a viable uh, security partner for India. I think that you're going to hear a lot more arguments from the, from U.S. officials that Russia is going to be you know, cash strapped, isolated, sanctioned. It's not going to be in a position to produce so many weapons and supply them to India. There's going to be a lot of discussion about how Russia can't be counted on to support India if China were to stage provocations on India's border. So I think that's where that's where the direction of things could go. The U.S.-India relationship will be will be just fine. But certainly, given events of recent weeks, I think it's clear that the Russia factor had previously been a mere nuisance, but it has become something closely approximating an irritant, though a one that one that's manageable. What what are the ties that bind between Russia and India beyond arms supplies? How how, how reliant? Is India on Russia for, say, food or other, and or Ukraine itself, a mass, a major producer of grain? Yeah. So in terms of uh, India's reliance on Russia, it really does revolve around arms. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of attention has been brought to the fact that India has looked into this uh, this mechanism, uh, this rupee ruble arrangement that would allow India to do commercial trade with Russia uh, without using dollars and avoiding U.S. sanctions, but. You know, at the end of the day, India doesn't really do much. Uh, it doesn't do a tremendous amount of trade um, with Russia on issues like oil. Um, and I think that's where it could be fairly easy for the U.S. and its Western partners to make an argument to India that they, that if they can provide uh, those types of goods at, at the same quality and the same good price, there's no reason for India to be um, uh, to, to be relying on them. It's very different with arms, just because India is so much more heavily reliant on Russian arms than it is on Russian oil or Russian food or anything like that. But I think that it's not just the transactional aspects of the India-Russia relationship that make it important, but really the broader 
the historical context uh, to it. It's, it's, it's a very old relationship. Uh, there's a Soviet, uh, there was a Cold War era partnership between India and the Soviets. And you know, there's this strong perception in New Delhi and among many Indians that Russia has in many ways been India's most dependable partner. It's always backed India on the global stage, including at the UN, where Russia has consistently voted on Kashmir related resolutions that always support India. And India doesn't take that type of thing lightly. So I think that's another factor that plays into you know, how New, New Delhi goes about this. I mean, we may think from a purely moral perspective, you know, why is India not condemning these horrible things that Russia is doing? But you know, clearly New Delhi thinks, it, thinks about these things in a different way. If the U.S. were able to convince India to take a harder line against Russia, uh, does India have enough influence to, to make a difference in that regard? Well, I mean, it, it, it theoretically has leverage because of its uh, very close relationship uh, with Russia. But you're right. I mean, it's unclear if that would actually mean anything. And, you know, one, one position I've taken in a lot of my, my writing in recent weeks is that it may be unrealistic for the U.S. to try to push India to change its position and come out uh, uh, guns blazing, and crit criticizing Putin. And it would be better to try to get India to... Um, to, to pitch itself as a, as a mediator, as a third party hmm. mediator, where it, where it presses uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians alike to, um, to talk things over. And in fact, Prime Minister Modi has indeed, according to Indian readouts of these types of calls, Modi has apparently at least once made that pitch to, to Putin. Um, so, you know, it, it, but then again, would India really wanna put itself out there and do that? It, India itself doesn't like there to be any third party mediators in its own disputes, including Kashmir. So it's tough, but you're right. At the end of the day, Putin, I mean, clearly it doesn't seem like he'd, he'd want to listen to anyone, including close partners like, uh, like India. China may be different, of course, because Russia is much more reliant on Chinese largesse than it is on Indian largesse. So, M Michael, before we wrap, thank you. This has been really, really informative. But, you know, while we're talking relations, what is the current status of uh, Pakistani-Indian relations? Well, they've been in a, in a what I would describe as a, uh, an uneasy um, paralysis. Well, they're in a paralysis, uh, but they're not in deep crisis. Uh, about a year ago, actually about 15 months ago, there was a, um, a new truce, a new border truce along the line of control. And that really brought down tensions. Uh, it meant that cross-border firing and that type of thing went down. So that's helped, but the relationship really hasn't moved forward that much. Uh, it is notable that Shabazz Sharif, since he took office, has offered some very conciliatory remarks and, and India's Prime Minister Modi did the same uh, via tweet. Uh, but then again, honestly, I think that from India's perspective, it looks at Shabazz Sharif's government as a temporary one, one that's only going to be around for a year at the most. And you know, would it really make sense for India to try to extend an olive branch, particularly for a government that uh, that um, uh, that uh, reflects this Hindu nationalist policy that doesn't really leave much space for for outreach to Pakistan? Um, so I think that, that we may. I think the rhetoric of the relationship will be less sharp. We could hear some more nice words, but I don't think that we should expect to see any type of major breakthrough uh, in the coming weeks or months, even with this new government in Pakistan. Well, Michael, again, thank you very much. As always, very informative. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the program. Thanks. Always a pleasure, John. Okay. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, uh, for all of us at the Wilson Center, we hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again next week. Until then, I'm John Molesky. For all of us at the Center, thanks for being here.